Greetings everyone, and welcome to Back to Ashes. My name is Phoenix. If you are new here and enjoy what you are hearing, or you've already been here and haven't done so just yet, please don't forget to subscribe, like, share, and comment. Not only does it help the channel out, but it also reminds you of every time I upload a video. Now it's time to sit back, relax, kick back, grab a snack, or tuck in and get warm, and prepare for this dose of vocal melatonin entitled True Unsolved Mysteries, Volume 20. Right after this intro and ad will play, right after the first case and ad will play, and after that there will be no more ads within this video. Disclaimer, some of these cases may contain material not suitable for all. Listener discretion is advised. The Shocking Disappearance of David Barclay Miller David Barclay Miller disappeared May 19, 1998, Red Rock or Secret Mountain Wilderness Area, Arizona. David Barclay Miller, 22, was last seen leaving for a two-and-a-half-day hiking trip in Sedona, Arizona, on May 19, 1998. He was an experienced hiker and was employed by the Sedona Forest Service at the time he went missing. Co-workers saw him on May 19th at the Beaver Creek Ranger Station, and he left a note that evening at the station saying he was going hiking in the Red Rock Secret Mountain Wilderness area. Miller never returned from his trip and has not been seen since then. His vehicle was found abandoned at the Bolte Arc Trail. He was 5'11", 160 pounds, and was wearing a t-shirt, shorts, and black hiking boots, and carrying a forest green Gregory backpack. He had sandy blonde hair, blue or grayish eyes, and wore glasses or contact lenses. The search for David was abandoned after a few days and 12 years later. There's still no sign of him. His case remains cold. The Strange Disappearance of Drake Kramer in the Grand Canyon National Park Jake Lyons Kramer disappeared February 1, 2015, near Bright Angel Lodge on the south rim of the Grand Canyon National Park in Arizona. This case has now been revised in March 2021. 21-year-old Drake Lyons Kramer of San Antonio was enrolled to study geology at the University of Texas. He was last seen on Sunday, February 1st, 2015, near the Bright Angel Lodge on the south rim of the Grand Canyon National Park in Arizona. He was reported missing the next day by his parents, Robin and Brenda Kramer. He left his vehicle, a white 2007 Mazda 323 with the Texas license plate number CSK1767 at the lodge and he has never been heard from again. Drake Kramer's Visit to the Grand Canyon Drake stayed the night as a guest at the Bright Angel Lodge, checking out the next morning. He sent his family a strange text message before his disappearance in which he said he had to give his body to Mother Earth. The family was surprised he had driven to California and then on to the Grand Canyon. They last saw him on January 29th when they went to see the film American Sniper, and he reported to be in good spirits, according to Kramer's father. It was very unlike him to travel to places like the Grand Canyon alone, but he had been to the area two to three times before. However, he was very experienced in the outdoors. The Search for Drake Park rangers and search and rescue teams searched the South Rim area from Hermit's Rest on to the west side to Grandview on the east for around six days. The Park Service said, teams of searchers have walked miles along the canyon rim, searched heavily forested areas, utilized dog teams, performed several over-the-rim technical searches, and conducted multiple aerial reconnaissance missions to support ground searchers. But the search was to no avail. Ranger said, while the weather with daytime temperatures in the 60s has been good, the terrain being searched 
flat on top of the rim, but rocky and unstable, just off the edge. It could be a challenge. There are trees down there, there are shrubs, there are rocks. The canyon walls are often shaded depending on the time of day. It's just a real mix of terrain, which does make it difficult to work in. What happened to Drake Kramer? Drake's enigmatic text message to the parents of his desire to return to Mother Earth may have just been a reference to a need to escape to the outdoors. However, it is unusual in this area of the south rim of the Grand Canyon that no sign of him or his remains has been found. The Disappearance of Leah Roberts Early Life Leah Roberts was born on July 23, 1976, to Nancy and Stancil Roberts. The youngest of three children, she was raised in Durham, North Carolina. While Leah had a relatively normal childhood, things took a turn at 17 when her father was diagnosed with a life-threatening respiratory disease. Three years later, her mother died unexpectedly of heart disease. Leah, a sophomore at North Carolina State University, took some time off to be with her family before turning in the fall of 1998. Not long after her return to school, Leah was involved in a near-fatal car accident when a transport truck turned out in front of her. She suffered a punctured lung and shattered femur, for which she had a metal rod placed into her leg. Her survival was a life-changing moment for the young woman, who viewed it as a second chance. While attending North Carolina State University, Leah played soccer and did a semester in Spain. She also signed up for a field study program in Costa Rica when, once again, tragedy struck. In 1999, after years of dealing with his condition, Stancil passed away. While upset, Leah decided to continue with her trip to the Caribbean, and it was an experience that completely changed her worldview. She became interested in life's adventure and wanted to see the world. She began writing poetry and keeping a journal, and ultimately decided to leave school just six months before she was slated to graduate with a degree in Spanish and anthropology. Upon leaving school, Leah, an already private person, drew away from her core friend group and began learning to play the guitar and practice photography. She also adopted a kitten. Disappearance On the morning of March 9, 2000, Leah received a phone call from her sister, Kara, who asked how she was doing. At 11 a.m., she also confirmed plans with her roommate, Nicole Weeks, for a babysitting job the following day. When Leah didn't show up to babysit, Nicole didn't think much of it, given their conflicting schedules. It wasn't uncommon for them to go a day or two without seeing each other. However, she began to grow more worried by March 12th, prompted in part by calls from friends looking to get in touch with Leah. She called Kara around noon that day, and the pair spent the next 24 hours calling everyone who knew Leah to no avail. On March 13th, Leah's friend met Kara and Nicole at her residence. Kara searched her sister's room and determined that she left voluntarily, given the items that were missing, including her new kitten, B. Despite this assumption, she still reported Leah missing to the Raleigh Police Department, given her sister's mental and emotional state. Kara returned to the home the following day to double-check that she hadn't overlooked anything. It was during this second search that she came across the note Leah had left for Nicole. With it, she'd left enough money to cover a month's worth of bills, and while it was largely cryptic, the letter had a happy tone. Leah also used the opportunity to make reference to Jack Kirak's book, On the Road. This jogged Nicole's memory with the missing woman's roommate recalling a conversation they had about a cross-country road trip. This brought in mind another Kirak book, Dharma Burns, which is set in Whatcom County, Washington. Curious as to where her sister had traveled, 
Kira began looking into Leah's bank records. She'd been given power of attorney when Leah went to Costa Rica. She'd withdrawn $3,000 in cash at around 6 p.m. on March 9th, with there being a motel charge in Memphis, Tennessee the following day. Additional spending showed Leah had driven west along I-40 until she hit California, at which time she headed north on I-5. Her last noted transaction was that shortly after midnight on March 13th at a gas station in Brooks, Oregon. While Kara was examining Leah's financial records, Nicole and her friends began canvassing the area. They came across a woman who regularly talked with Leah at the Cup of Joe coffee house. She revealed that the missing woman had been discussing her desire to visit Desolation Peak in Whatcom County, Washington the exact location mentioned in Dharma Burns. On March 18th, a local man and his wife were going for an early morning run in Mount Baker National Forest in Washington when they came across a crashed vehicle. The white Jeep Cherokee was found along Canyon Creek Road, 30 miles east of Bellingham. The man called 911. When deputies arrived on the scene, they felt something was very suspicious but also considered the vehicle could have been abandoned by a truck driver, as was somewhat common for the area. However, upon further examination, they found the broken window of the Jeep had been covered with towels and clothes, indicating someone had been staying in it. They also located a number of belongings, including a passport, checkbook, guitar, driver's license, and CDs. Given the Jeep had a North Carolina license plate, the authorities in that state were called, at which point it was discovered that the vehicle was linked to Leah's missing persons report. Officers left a note at Kara's residence, asking that she contact the Whatcom County Sheriff's Office. It was then that she learned that Leah was truly missing. Investigation Upon learning about the crash, the Whatcom County Sheriff's Office sent officers to the scene. An investigation of the site showed Leah's Jeep Cherokee had been traveling between 30 to 40 miles per hour when it went off the road, meaning whoever was within it at that time would, or should, have been severely injured. However, no signs were found to show that anyone was injured, nor were there footprints leaving the scene. On March 21, 2000, Kara and her brother Heath traveled to Bellingham, Washington, to begin their own search into Leah's disappearance. Upon being brought to the area where her Jeep was found, they began to wonder if she'd maybe hit her head and wandered away. But no area hospitals had records of treating an injured or disoriented woman. While sifting through the items in the vehicle, investigators found no signs of Leah's kitten, but they did locate a keepsake box. Within it was a movie ticket stub for the film American Beauty at the theater in Bellis Fair Mall in Bellingham. It was timestamped 2.10 p.m. on March 13, 2000. No one remembered seeing Leah at the theater, but Kara did visit the sit-down restaurant at the mall, where two patrons recalled seeing her. One said she was open and kind, while the other said they chatted about Jack Kirak and her reasons for being in Washington. She told investigators that Leah left with a man, also known as Barry, and provided a description. This, however, went against the account of the first individual, who said the missing woman had left the restaurant alone. As missing persons flyers were put up across Bellingham, investigators and agents with the FBI began to properly process Leah's car. They came across a pair of pants with $2,400 in the pockets, meaning she'd only spent $100 of her $2,500 she arrived in the area with. As well, they came across her mother's engagement ring under a floorboard, As Leah rarely took it off, this led the police to theorize that she had been intentionally harmed. Approximately one week after the Jeep was discovered, 
An anonymous man called in to say that he and his wife may have run into Leah at a Texaco gas station in Everett, Washington, shortly after it's believed the vehicle was abandoned. He said she appeared to be disoriented and wasn't aware of her identity. Unfortunately, he ended the call before investigators could ask him for additional details. It's believed this sighting is valid, with the Woodcomb County Sheriff's Office assuming the man panicked during the call for unknown reasons. Within two weeks of the Jeep's discovery, searches began of Mount Baker Snoqualmie National Forest beginning on Canyon Creek Road. An area was mapped out based on how far an injured person could travel on foot, after which dogs, ground personnel, and helicopters were brought in. Nothing was found, leading investigators to theorize that Leah either wasn't in the vehicle when it crashed or that she wasn't hurt in the incident. While this search was occurring, officers contacted the gas station in Brooks, Oregon, that Leah had visited before she went missing. Surveillance footage found within was collected, showing her by herself. However, she kept peering out the door while waiting for the clerk to ring in her purchase. Unfortunately, there were no cameras pointed outside, meaning no one knows who or what Leah was looking at. In 2005, volunteers from a North Carolina-based missing persons awareness group organized a caravan across the United States to raise awareness about several cases, including Leah's. The following year, investigators re-examined the Jeep to see if anything had been overlooked. The hood was popped open, and along with fingerprints, signs were found to show tampering. The starter relay had had its wire cut, allowing the vehicle to accelerate without a driver behind the wheel. The tampering was like done by a mechanic or someone with knowledge of cars. This brought officers back to the second man of the restaurant who was in the military and had experience as a mechanic. He's since moved to Canada, meaning investigators had to contact Canadian authorities to obtain his fingerprints and DNA. The fingerprints were a dead end, and no updates have been provided regarding whether his DNA was a match to that found on Leah's belongings. The Details Leah Toby Roberts went missing from Whatcom County, Washington in mid-March 2000. She was 23 years old at the time and was driving a white 1993 Jeep Grand Cherokee, North Carolina license plate JVP-2881. When she disappeared, Leah was 5'6 in height and weighed 130 pounds. She had sandy blonde hair and blue eyes and was last known to be wearing several pieces of jewelry. 14 karat gold earrings with 3 karat ruby stones and 3 rings on her right hand, including a 14 karat white gold ring set with a .45 karat emerald cut diamond flanked by two .07 carats baguette diamonds. Leah had a number of distinguishable features, including dimples, a surgical scar on her right hip, and a beauty mark above the upper right corner of her lip. The same surgery that caused the scar on her hip also resulted in a metal rod being placed into her leg. This would have a unique serial number. Other notable details about Leah or that she has a strong southern accent, is a vegetarian, she smokes cigarettes, and speaks fluid Spanish. Case Contact Information Leah's case is currently classified as endangered missing. Anyone with information is asked to contact the Whatcom County Sheriff's Office at either 360-676-6653 or 360-778-6600 or 360-778-6760. The Sheriff's Office can be contacted via its dispatch center at 360-676-6711 or its tip line at 360-778-6663.
Gwinnett County Jane Doe, 2023. On June 2nd, 2023, the decomposed body of an unidentified female was discovered on private property in the 4300 block of Abbott's Bridge Road in Duluth, Gwinnett County, Georgia. The mostly skeletal remains were found by the son of the property owner who was cleaning the commercial site. It's not clear exactly where on the property Jane Doe's remains were found. Autopsy The descendant's remains were brought to the Gwinnett County Medical Examiner's Office, where it was determined she died between 2022 and 2023, with the most likely time frame being within four months of her being discovered. Given the level of decomposition, a cause of death couldn't be determined. Details. The descendant is described as an African-American woman between the ages of 25 to 35. She stood between 5'1 and 5'5 and was found wearing a camisole size small with a cross back. Given the state of decomposition, her weight and eye color couldn't be determined. However, a detailed description of her hair was made available with reports stating it was either black or brown in color, featuring long extensions and was braided, with a ring-style accessories in it. Jane Doe had a number of notable features, the most prominent features of which were her several piercings. Her tongue and navel were pierced, along with either her nose or lip, and she had two dermal piercings on her back possibly the lower section. As well, she had a tattoo on her upper back, near her neck or shoulder. While the state of the remains made it difficult to fully discern the image, it's described as being banner style with red and blue as the prominent colors. Investigation On June 20th, 2023, investigators conducted a search at the home of 52-year-old Abdorium Jalal at 748 Scott Boulevard in Decatur, DeKalb County, Georgia. This was the second search of the property, with the first occurring on April 29th, when Jalal was taken into custody for allegedly causing an explosion at a Bank of America ATM at the North Cabal Mall the previous month. While Jalal faces both federal and local charges in connecting to the ATM bombing, Investigators haven't revealed his relation to the Jane Doe's case. According to local records, he's not the owner of the Abbott's Bridge Road property, and it's unclear if he's a tenant. Case Contact Information Anyone with information regarding Jane Doe's case is asked to contact the Duluth Police Department at 770-497-5000. Tips can also be submitted to the Gwinnett County Medical Examiner's Office at 678-442-3160. The Disappearance of Gwen Brunel Early Life Gwendolyn Margaret Gwen Brunel was born on December 9, 1995, to Betsy and Andy Brunel. Throughout her childhood and into her teen years, much of Gwen's energy went into raising and showing purebred rabbits, and she was nationally recognized for her talents. She began in 4-H and, by 2007, had won the Showmanship Championship title at the Western Idaho Fair. She then went on to compete in the American Rabbit Breeders Association and was named its queen at the national competition in 2011. At the time of her disappearance, she was working, becoming a certified rabbit judge. On a more personal level, Gwen struggled with a condition that made her moody and inattentive for which she was taking medication. Lead up to disappearance. On June 26, 2023, Gwen left her family's home in Boise, Idaho for a road trip to a small town just outside of Fresno, California, where she said she was going to meet a renowned rabbit judge. 
When spoken to after the 27-year-old's disappearance, the person in question denied ever speaking to Gwen or having any knowledge of her plans to visit. At 11 a.m., Gwen set off, promising her boyfriend, Gerald Sanderson, and her parents that she'd keep in touch and that she may possibly make a stop in Reno, Nevada to break up the several hundred mile drive. However, her cell phone signal soon disappeared. Both Gerald and her father tried to get in contact with her over the next several months, but received no response to their texts. By the next morning, the former was worried enough to share his concerns with Gwen's parents, who reported her missing to the Boise Police Department. Disappearance What happened between Gwen leaving home and her being reported missing is all based on surveillance footage and witness accounts. When she was 20 miles from her residence, she stopped at a convenience store in Nampa, as confirmed by both security video and her debit card records. While the footage showed her purchasing snacks, the most interesting bit was that she'd changed her clothes. She'd left home wearing a blue shirt and Nike boots. What also struck her family as odd was that she visited the store three hours after she had embarked on her journey, a rather long time to have traveled just 20 miles. The next time Gwen was caught on surveillance footage was at 12 p.m. on June 27, 2023. This time, she was at the Sinclair gas station in Jordan Valley, Oregon, and she was seen purchasing gas, after which she went to Mrs. Z's convenience store, where she bought water and some peanuts. She'd also asked if the establishment sold razors, but was told they didn't. Despite telling the gas station attendant that she was in a hurry, Gwen was seen sitting in her car after an hour, Concerned, the worker went to check on the 27-year-old and was told she was doing okay. The Search Three days after Gwen was reported missing on June 30, 2023, her car was found abandoned at Sucre Creek in Malauer County, Oregon. Just a mile away from Highway 95, it had allegedly been in the area since the 28th when a UPS driver first saw it parked off the side of the road during his lunch break. A police officer was dispatched to the area for an unrelated reason and, curious, ran the 2008 Honda Elements plate and discovered Gwen's missing persons report. When found, the vehicle was facing northeast in an area commonly used by visitors to the location. It was unlocked with the key still in the ignition and the windows were partially opened. Also found inside were Gwen's leather shoulder bag, which contained her wallet, credit cards, and driver's license. Travel bags with her personal items, protein bar wrappers, and empty soda cans, and three cages holding 11 rabbits, five of which were deceased. A water trowel and a week's worth of food were also within the car. Not far from the Honda Element, Police found Gwen's purple bathrobe, which had been folded as if someone had used it as a cushion, as well as the water jug she'd purchased at the convenience store, now half empty. The vehicle's discovery prompted the extensive search of the area, with investigators and Gwen's family and friends looking on foot, manning ATVs, and even going on horseback in an attempt to locate any clues as to her whereabouts. Four trained dogs were also brought in to help with the search. After days of failed effort, police suspended their official search on July 10, 2023. The next clue in the case didn't end up showing up until two months later. On September 10, 2023, one of Gwen's t-shirts was found tangled in a barbed wire fence about a mile and a half from her car at Dog Creek. This prompted the search to partially resume, with her boots and a pair of mismatched socks being located approximately 80 yards south of where the shirt had been found. Interestingly, the boots had been stacked in a crisscrossed manner. Details 
Gwendolyn Margaret Gwen Brunel went missing in Jordan Valley, Malauer County, Oregon, on June 27, 2023. She was 27 years of age and was last seen wearing a dark-colored t-shirt, black leggings, and black knee-high dress boots with a flat sole. She stands at 5'7 and weighs between 140 to 160 pounds. She has brown eyes and long medium brown or auburn hair that's usually up in a ponytail. Gwen's ears are pierced and she's left-handed. At the time of her disappearance, Gwen was driving a gray 2008 Honda Element with Idaho license plate 5WT6X. Case Contact Information At present, Gwen's case is classified as a missing persons investigation, with her parents concerned that she may have become disoriented and wandered far from her car or that she was abducted. There's also a possibility she'd lied about the reason for her trip, with her family positing that she may have been meeting up with an unknown individual. Anyone with information regarding the case is asked to contact the Boise Police Department at either 208-377-6790 or 280-570-6000. Tips can also be made into the Malauer County Sheriff's Office at 541-473-5125. The Disappearance of Lovely Angie Brooks Disappearance Lovely Angie Brooks was last seen by her elderly father on January 10, 2023, when she was leaving their shared residence in the 1000 block of Barlin Drive on the south side of Richmond, Virginia. By all indications, she'd intended to return with the majority of her belongings still there. The only things she took with her were her cell phone and purse. It wasn't until seven days later that Pam Harris, Angie's sister, learned she was missing. Pam's daughter was living with her aunt and grandfather and had grown concerned over Angie's absence. Given she was her father's primary caregiver and regularly kept in contact with her family, it wasn't like the 53-year-old to be gone for so long without letting anyone know of her whereabouts. On January 18, 2023, one day after learning her sister was missing, Pam reported Angie's disappearance to the Richmond Police Department. Investigation By the time of her disappearance, Angie didn't have a regular mode of transportation. Her bank account had been inactive since January 10, 2023, aside from automatic Social Security disability deposits. Investigators have looked at her cell phone records, but they were unable to reveal if anything of interest were found, given the ongoing nature of the investigation. The last major update in the case came in May of 2023, when investigators said they'd identified a few persons of interest. Details Lovely Andrea Angie Brooks went missing from Richmond, Virginia on January 10, 2023. She was 53 years old, and what she was last seen wearing is unknown. She stands around 5'9 and 6' foot tall, and weighs between 175 to 185 pounds, with some sources saying she's closer to 140 pounds. She has black hair, brown eyes, and pierced ears, and has a small heart tattoo on her chest. Angie is transgender and has been identifying as female since she was 18 years of age. Case Contact Information Currently, Angie's case is classified as endangered missing, with foul play suspected, given how uncharacteristic her disappearance is. Anyone with information regarding Angie's whereabouts, or the case in general, is asked to contact the Richmond Police Department at either 804 646-5100 or 804-646-6764. Tips can also be called into Crime Stoppers at 804-780-1000. 
The Murder of Sharon Thor Early Life Sharon Thor was born on October 28, 1966, in Elizabeth, New Jersey. She was one of five children of Frank Sr. and Sonia Thor, and was the only daughter in the family. While Sharon was growing up, the family moved a few times, first to Roselle, then to Franklin, where they settled. The Thor children initially attended parochial school before switching to the public system upon relocating to Franklin. In the fall of 1982, Sharon was a student at Franklin Student High School and an avid dancer, having taken lessons since she was in preschool. She was so dedicated to the craft that, prior to enrolling in classes, she wore a brace for six months to help straighten her legs, which were turned inward. At the time of her murder, Sharon was just two days shy of her 16th birthday. The Murder On the evening of October 26, 1982, Sharon was watching television while her father was relaxing in the living room and her mother was in the kitchen. She answered the phone when it rang at around 5.30 p.m., and it appeared as though the call was for her, given her tone and the fact she stretched the cord as far as it could go so she could talk to the person on the other end with some privacy away from her parents. Immediately after hanging up the phone, Sharon ran out the door without her coat or purse, telling her mother she'd be back shortly. As the pair were to leave for the 15-year-old's dance class at 5.45 p.m., Sonia expected her daughter to return after only a few minutes. However, time ticked by without Sharon ever coming back to the house. Concerned, Sonia and Frank went to the Franklin Township Police Department to report their daughter missing, but were told they needed to wait 24 hours, as was the protocol back in the 1980s. Knowing they couldn't sit back and wait until the next day, they launched their own search, going to the dance school in places Sharon was known to frequent. Sonia even took the family's German shepherd to a nearby wooded area, but there was no sign of Sharon. Three days after she went missing on October 29th, Sharon's bludgeoned body was discovered by a search team of firefighters in a wooded area just a quarter mile from her family's home on John E. Bush Avenue, approximately 25 yards from a dirt road and on private property maintained by a utility company. It appeared the person or persons responsible had attempted to cover up the crime. An autopsy showed Sharon had died from blunt force trauma just one hour after she'd left home on the evening of October 26th. Her head and chest had significant injuries, with multiple fractures to her ribs and skull. There was also indications of internal hemorrhaging. While it's believed the 15-year-old was sexually assaulted, giving her jeans and sweater were partially removed, this hasn't been confirmed. Near the body, investigators found a cement cinder block and a 2-inch by 4-inch piece of lumber, which were likely the murder weapons. Investigation Within days of Sharon's body being found, investigators had interviewed 85 people, including family, friends, and persons of interest. Over a dozen detectives from both the Somerset County Prosecutor's Office and the Franklin Township Police Department were assigned to the case, with a number of individuals identified as possibly being involved. However, they were never able to confirm any strong suspects. According to Sonia, many of the parents at Franklin High School didn't want police to speak with their children. She believes someone who knew the area killed Sharon, given the area her body was found in. While owned by the aforementioned utility company and posted with no trespassing signs, there were no fences to keep anyone out and it was a known hangout spot for local teens who used it to party, ride dirt bikes, and socialize. Early into the investigation, a child from the neighborhood came forward and said they remembered seeing Sharon getting into a car with a loud muffler and two white men inside, one in the driver's seat who had dark hair and one in the back. 
the teenager reportedly ran to the vehicle and jumped into the passenger side seat. In 2009, when the case was reopened, it was revealed the pair were likely local to Franklin or either in their teens or early 20s when Sharon was murdered. Along with the police investigation, Sharon's siblings tried to hunt down her murderer. They knock on doors and talk to a man who they believed was responsible or knew the individual or individuals who were. Following the case being reopened in 2009, it was announced that a hearing was held regarding new evidence. Talking with the media, a defense attorney representing a possible suspect said they were to be represented with a motion to hold her client in investigative custody, as well as to obtain the unnamed individual's DNA. Nothing has been released publicly regarding the outcome of this hearing. In 2022, the Somerset County Prosecutor's Office reiterated that the case was still being investigated and was in the hands of the Major Crimes Unit. The following year, Sharon's remains were exhumed, presumably to see if there was any additional evidence to be gathered and to collect a usable DNA sample. Unhappy with how the investigation has proceeded, her niece, Sam, had launched a Change.org petition, asking that more be done to solve her aunt's murder. There are two rewards available for information leading to the arrest and conviction of those responsible for Sharon's murder. Crime Stoppers of Somerset County is offering $5,000, while a community-raised fund has $4,000 in it. Case Contact Info Anyone with information regarding the case is asked to contact the Somerset County Prosecutor's Office at 908-231-7100. Tips can also be submitted anonymously via Crime Stoppers of Somerset County at 1-888-577-8477. The Disappearance of Emily Bailey Early Life Emily Bailey was born in December of 1998 as the fourth of five siblings. She was close to her mother, Lori Bevan, and her older brother, Ben Bailey, with whom she shared many private jokes and kept in constant contact. Growing up, Emily moved between neighborhoods in East and Central Hamilton, Ontario and attended four elementary schools between junior and kindergarten and grade eight. While she attended Hill Park Secondary School as a teenager, she reportedly missed most of her classes, having become friends with a group of students who weren't necessarily the best people to hang out with. During this time, she continued to move around a lot, spending a few years in Brampton and struggled with depression. According to relatives and friends, Emily was full of personality and incredibly outgoing. While she may have struggled later in life, she was, at heart, a good person who made friends everywhere she went, as her sense of humor was contagious. As she entered adulthood, Emily began to struggle with drug addiction and homelessness, which she tried to hide from her family out of fear they'd reject her. She managed to get clean twice, both times when she was pregnant, but found herself sucked back into that world once she had given birth. Given this lifestyle, Emily often found herself sleeping in tents or couch surfing, not the sort of environment you'd want to raise children, her two daughters, Harper and Kinsley. So they live with their grandparents. Emily was determined to make a change and was putting a plan in place to get clean, find employment and counseling, and get her girls back. In the fall of 2021, Emily began seeing a man named Jeffrey Jeff Johnson, a friend's brother-in-law. The relationship was described as rocky by friends who also revealed to the media that Emily soon got pregnant. The then 23-year-old began to change. Once an avid poster on social media, by that December, she had stopped posting entirely. Disappearance 
The days before Emily's disappearance saw her spending time with friends. On the evening of Christmas, she was with a close friend. She again visited this person three days later to dye her hair and have dinner. On December 31, 2021, she and Jeff visited another friend, Nikki. The trio hung out until 10.30 p.m., at which point the couple got into a cab to return to Jeff's house. According to the driver, he and Emily were dropped off at the residence on Weir Street North near Barton Street East and Kenilworth Avenue North. Emily had told Nikki they were attending a party, but many believe it was just the pair drinking at the house. She'd also reportedly messaged several people that day, inquiring about getting a ride somewhere. After Emily's disappearance, Brandon Hunter, her ex-boyfriend and the father of one of her daughters, claimed to have spoken with this Jeff, who told him that the couple had gotten into an argument at some point that night. Emily left the house, but Jeff didn't say where she'd went. At 2.39 a.m. the next morning, Brandon just so happened to send his ex a message on Facebook, which marked the last time Emily opened one from anyone. It's reported that the last time Emily was seen was between 8 a.m. and 12 p.m. on January 1, 2022 on Weir Street. She hasn't been seen or heard from since. It took about a week and a half for the 23-year-old to be reported missing when she failed to attend a scheduled visit with one of her daughters. Brandon called the police on January 10, 2022 after being unable to get a hold of her. Given she was in constant contact with her loved ones, this was seen as very out of character for Emily. The Search Police attempted to search Jeff's residence on the day Emily was reported missing, but he refused to let officers in, claiming he had COVID-19 and had just had hand surgery. He claimed the injury happened while he was sharpening a chainsaw on either January 2nd or 3rd, 2022. Given Jeff was the last person to see Emily alive, investigators conducted searches at properties he has ties to, including the house via a search warrant, and a milling property in Dunville, Ontario. Forensic testing was done at the residence and nothing was reportedly found at the latter location. Emily's family had been active in the search from very early on, putting up missing persons posters, holding rallies, and creating a dedicated Facebook group they even contacted the organization Please Bring Me Home to see if the members would assist. While they did at first, the group paused their searches after speaking with the Hamilton Police Service, who stated the investigation was active. Please Bring Me Home tends to focus on cold cases. Two months into the investigation, in March of 2022, it was announced the case had been turned over to the Hamilton Police Service's homicide unit, with investigators stating that, based on the evidence, they believed Emily was murdered and her body disposed of. They also revealed that they were looking for information about the owner of a dark or black GMC or Chevrolet pickup truck that Emily may have been connected to a week before her disappearance. Jeff owned a truck matching this description, which had been impounded in November 2021. He then borrowed a relative's truck, which was also black. The latter was searched, but nothing of any significance was found. In April of 2022, police posted a media release to dispel rumors that Emily's disappearance and presumed murder occurred at the hands of a serial killer targeting tattooed women in Hamilton and the surrounding area. The theory emerged after a post was shared to social media suggesting a connection between Emily's case and that of 33-year-old Stacy Raspberry, who went missing in February of 2022 in the Niagara region. Investigators said there was no evidence the cases were connected, nor was there a serial killer on the loose. Over a year later, in May of 2023, an image was posted to Emily's TikTok account, which hadn't been active since before she went missing. 
It was a photograph of a dog and featured a 15-second clip of 5050's song, Cupid. Investigators believe the account was hacked and said they planned to reach out to TikTok. In July 2023, Hamilton's police board approved a $20,000 reward for information leading to the location of Emily's remains and the conviction of those responsible for her disappearance. By this time, more than 30 witnesses had been interviewed, several search warrants executed, and searches conducted within and outside of Hamilton. Despite these efforts, little evidence has been uncovered, with investigators saying they're running out of investigative avenues. Emily's DNA and information has since been uploaded into a national database. Investigators say there are people out there who know what happened, but they refuse to come forward. Details Emily Bailey was last seen on Weir Street in Hamilton, Ontario, Canada on January 1st, 2022. She was 23 years old and was wearing a yellow Billabong brand hoodie and a long black winter coat. She was also carrying a light blue backpack with black handles. Emily is described as a white female who would today be 25 years old. She stands between 5'3 and 5'4 and weighs 100 to 134 pounds. At the time of her disappearance, she had shoulder-length black or brown hair with dyed green highlights and her eyes were brown. The missing woman had two tattoos, an elephant on her left forearm and Batman's symbol on the outside of her right forearm. Case Contact Info Emily's disappearance is currently being investigated as a homicide, given the high possibility of foul play. Anyone with information regarding the case is asked to contact the Hamilton Police Service at either 905-546-2963 or 905-546-4863. Tips can also be submitted anonymously via Crime Stoppers at 1-800-222-8477. And that, dear listeners, brings a close to these Unsolved Mysteries, Volume 20. I'd like to take a moment and give a very special shout-out to the reformed members of Back to Ashes. Tammy Slayton, Mrs. Innerscare, Tina Mead, Colt Stone Wolf, Luz Crispin, C.A.G., Denise Sess, Samantha Place, Stephanie McLaren, Corpse Lover, Norma D.W., Chrissy Elias, Cindy Cleveland, and Patty's niece. Thank you all so much for being huge supporters of Back to Ashes and your continued support. I appreciate each and every last one of you. If you are sleeping, I hope Slumberland is treating you comfortably. If you're awake, I hope you've enjoyed these cases. In the meantime, please take care of yourselves. I'll be reading to you soon. Have yourself a good morning, a good afternoon, or a good evening. Peace, love, and light to you all.